Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and a uh, very warm welcome to one of the highlights uh, of annual conference, The Debate. Uh, I'm David Brindle from The Guardian, uh, and I'm here to, uh, to see fair play uh, and uh, call the outcome uh, at the end of what I'm confident will be uh, a lively and uh, spirited uh, uh, exchange, having, having met our, our speakers. Um, our motion. This House believes that occupational therapy needs to be predominantly based in public health, not in secondary or tertiary services. So the theme, highly topical, uh, is how uh, occupational therapy should really best position uh, itself uh, as a discipline uh, to be a lead player in the changing and maturing health and care system. As chair, I offer uh, no view, of course. Uh, I would simply observe uh, that much of the discussion uh, around the way forward for the system, the five-year uh, forward view in England, uh, delivering together uh, here in Northern Ireland, a healthier Wales and the Scottish Integrated uh, Health and Social Services Boards. Much of all of that centers on prevention and early intervention in the jargon, getting upstream. So to be and stay uh, at the forefront of that kind of policy and its practice, uh, to seize your uh, heroic destiny, as we were talking about on this platform earlier this afternoon, does occupational therapy need to be predominantly based in public health, as the motion say, says, or does it need to retain that broad footing uh, across health and care services? Uh, we have two speakers um, for the motion. Uh, Dora uh, O'Lone, chair of the uh, uh, of the colleges, Royal Colleges Board here in Northern Ireland, uh, and Dr. Anne Johnson, uh, who's a consultant occupational therapist based uh, in Bath, wearing uh, many hats, uh, and two uh, against the motion, uh, Dr. Jenny Preston, uh, again a consultant occupational therapist and chair of the Royal Colleges uh, Specialist Section for Neurological Practice, uh, and Professor Diane Cox, uh, Director of Research and Professor of Occupational Therapy at University of Cumbria. Each is going to speak uh, for uh, 10 minutes, uh, a strict maximum of 10 minutes, without the use of any props or any slides. Uh, we will then invite uh, questions and comments from you for about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, our speakers won't uh, directly respond to those uh, at that point. However, the two lead protagonists will then each have five minutes to, at the end to sum up and pick up some of the points uh, you have made. Again, those time limits, those five minutes, are, will be strictly enforced. I have um, been given authority to even interrupt the speakers in full flow, if necessary. Um, before we start, though, um, uh, there's going to be a show of hands, just to give us a feel for the view in the room uh, on the proposition at this stage, and also a benchmark to see uh, how views may change, one way or the other, um, during the course uh, of the debate. So to remind you, uh, that uh, motion, this House believes that occupational therapy needs to be predominantly based in public health, not in secondary or tertiary services. Can I see who at this stage is in favor of that proposition? Hands up, please. Thank you. That, I'd say that was, what, about 35%? Those against that proposition at this stage. Oh, interesting. That's rather, rather more. And abstentions. 
Well, okay, so I think that's about 35% for, 45, 50% against, and 10, 10 or 15% undecided at this stage. Let's see how that plays out. So let's hear uh, our first speaker speaking for the motion is Dora Olon. Dora. Need to move a bit quicker across that stage. Okay, hello. My name is Dora Olone, but today I am Dora the Explorer. And like the popular children's television character, I want to explore a different approach to service delivery. Getting My Life Back, our recent report, is a public health document. It calls for us to address the most important determinants of health, life expectancy, quality of life, education, employment, physical activity, and getting all this as early as possible. I believe that occupational therapy needs to be predominantly based in public health, not in secondary and tertiary services. And I want you to explore this concept with me. My own service in the Southern Trust here in Northern Ireland highlights the skill of the occupational therapist who embraces their dual training, not only in reducing the symptoms of depression and anxiety, but in actually facilitating the client's desire to engage with their family, to go out with family, manage their shopping by providing a wheelchair at the first point of care into mental health. Not through onward referral through this could easily have been provided within the GP surgery. So what is secondary and tertiary care? Secondary care is hospital and community care. Tertiary care is highly specialized treatment such as neurosurgery, transplants, secure forensic mental health services, etc. As of March 2017, there are 233 NHS providers of secondary and tertiary care, 152 foundation trusts and 81 aspirant trusts. That's non-NHS foundations. What do they do? Transport 4.7 million patients to A&E by ambulance, 21 million A&E attendances, and over 113 million outpatient appointments, provide 100 million contacts with community services, provide specialist mental health and learning disability services for over 1.8 million people, and deliver 648,000 babies. The total budget for the NHS in 2017-18 was 110.2 billion, and we needed more. Occupational therapists based in secondary services are reactive, responding to identified need. Need identified by the GP, or when someone has a light bulb moment and realizes that an occupational therapist needs to be involved. Imagine a world where occupational therapists are based in housing associations, architects, public planning. So your access has been considered before you buy your home, your doors are wide, electrical sockets are accessible, and your kitchen is adaptable across the lifespan. Leisure centres are fully accessible, and occupational therapists who are available to advise on health, well-being, occupation and leather, leisure activities. Shopping centres designed by occupational therapists. A workplace where you have an occupational therapist there to support optimum ergonomics, support you when you experience work, stress, and when all the diagnosis that anybody potentially could have, and the opportunity to be economically active and remain in work. Where GPs have occupational therapists to review sick note, fit notes. All schools have occupational therapists. Last night on UTV in Northern Ireland, schools were responding to childhood obesity by encouraging physical activity. Imagine the world where activity has purpose and meaning, including ensuring activities are developmentally focused, working from wide grip to tripod grip, sensory integration, as a focus for all children, engaging in meaningful activities and gaining self-esteem. Primary schools where there are areas of deficit, for instance, in dyslexia, dyspraxia, Asperger's, learn how to work to their strengths. Secondary, where resilience building and emotional intelligence is further honed. Anxiety management, mood management are key skills learned. GPs all have occupational therapists, so if you're diagnosed with a challenging condition, you can learn how to live better, enjoy life, ensuring a balanced lifestyle, work focused and providing advice and minor aids and identifying adaptations where needed at a very early stage. Everywhere you go, you are less disabled by your environment because an occupational therapist has been involved in the design. Atchison in 1988 from the World Health Organization defines public health as the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, promoting health through organized efforts of society, 
provide services and conditions where people can be healthy, improve their health and well-being, or prevent deterioration of their health. Public health focuses on the entire spectrum of health and well-being. As occupational therapists, we are public health. Therefore, I put to the audience that occupational therapy fits best within public health and therefore should be predominantly based in public health. We're living longer and the increase in life expectancy have been due to improved public health, i.e. clean water, sanitation, immunisation, improved education, working conditions and improved housing. But despite the creation of the NHS, over 70 years of access to free healthcare for all, we still have health inequalities. These will only be addressed by public health approaches, not by pumping more money into the NHS. Current services are struggling with demand. The only two ways of dealing with that are, one, making the systems more efficient, or two, getting people to look better after themselves and their own health, promoting re personal responsibility. That's why occupational therapists need to be accessible from cradle to grave in a public health, not predominantly in the NHS. So public health covers the entire spectrum and as occupational therapists, you are public health. That is the proposition uh, from Dora. Um, let us hear now from uh, Dr. Jenny Preston, who is the first speaker against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to my distinguished colleague for offering some very comprehensive arguments for occupational therapy and public health. Some might believe that there is a clear fit between occupational therapy and public health, with both viewing health in a holistic manner and seeking to support individuals and communities in achieving and maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Many people are in agreement that occupational therapists should focus on the development of the healthy habits early on and the prevention of a significant medical or emotional event. But let us be absolutely clear that by positioning occupational therapy predominantly within public health, the challenges of collaboration, integration, shared understanding of roles and responsibilities, and a deep and meaningful understanding of occupational therapy will not magically transform. Indeed, the evidence suggests that the, challenge of the, the challenges of the hierarchical structures is in fact even greater within primary care. Services remain fragmented, and there remains a lack of knowledge among the general public and the medical professionals regarding the services of occupational therapy. This side of the House firmly opposes the motion that occupational therapy needs to be predominantly based within public health, not in secondary or tertiary services. This rebuttal is framed within three key arguments. That the philosophical underpinnings of public health and occupational therapy are developed from competing paradigms. That the alignment of occupational therapy with public health is just the latest fad. And finally, the preventative approaches and secondary care are not mutually exclusive. Let me come to my first argument. Public health by nature is focused on population-based health and concerted efforts to maintain sustained behavioural change. Occupational therapy is also concerned about the wider spectrum of health and well-being, but from an individual perspective. Occupational therapy practice is focused on enabling individuals to change aspects of their person, their occupations, their environment, or some combination of these to enhance occupational participation. Clients are actively involved in the occupational therapy process. The outcomes are client-driven and diverse and measured in terms of participation, satisfaction derived from occupational participation, and or improvement in occupational performance. Therein lies an inherent challenge in reconciling the differences between population-based approaches to health promotion and prevention and the individual person-centered holistic approaches intrinsic to occupational therapy philosophy and practice. 
Occupational therapists across all health and social care organisations and beyond will access health-giving behaviours through enabling people to increase control over and improve their health. But that does not mean that occupational therapists need to be positioned within public health, or do we mean primary care? As it's hard to debate the role of occupational therapy within public health without reference to primary care. Despite the evidence supporting preventative approaches, the reality is that in 2015-16, there was a 28% increase in hospital admissions when compared to a decade ago. There is an estimated 3 million people living with diabetes in England. A 49% increase in the proportion of men classified as obese since 1993, and a 9% increase over four years in the number of falls related hospital admissions among older people, with the equivalent of 950 cases per day expected in the year 2020 to 2021. Current evidence often reflects models of occupational therapy practice based within primary care, not public health. It is therefore argued that the positioning of occupational therapy predominantly within public health can only be made possible with greater integration of public health and primary care reflecting mutual awareness, cooperation, collaboration and partnership. The evidence base for occupational therapy within health promotion remains weak, lacks a robust theoretical background, Frequently, frequently includes poorly planned interventions which are not systematically delivered and with weak evaluation. The occupational therapy profession must learn from a malalignment with the medical model for many years and must have the confidence, self-assurance and self-belief to stand as a profession within its own right. My second argument places the proposed alignment with public health as just the latest fad. This occupational therapy flirtation with public health is not new. In fact, we can trace an historical relationship with public health as far back as 1779. In her memorial lecture to Doris Sim, MBE, in 1999, Anne Wilcock recounted the story of one of the most significant public health developments in Scotland, of course. This is the story of Robert Owen, who lived between 1771 and 1858, and whose vision of a reformed society can be traced forward to Dr. Elizabeth Casson and the early days of occupational therapy in the 20th century through her contact with Octavia Hill. Owen was the son-in-law of a rich factory owner at New Lanark on the Upper Clyde, which was generally held to be a model of its kind, but did not meet Owen's exacting standards. Nevertheless, he took over the mills and immediately set about changing conditions according to his beliefs, centred on the need to improve the social well-being of the workers. Owen addressed many occupational health issues of the time, particularly occupational alienation and imbalance, which were a fact of life for the vast majority. Owen's beliefs and practical schemes to enable the social well-being of all through their day-to-day -day occupations what a strong influence on Octavia's philosophies and life works, which embodied many similar notions about the need for satisfying occupations. These, in turn, influenced Dr. Casson, who worked with her. Critically, and of particular relevance to this debate, Octavia Hill and Elizabeth Casson did not become public health practitioners, but they had the vision and the belief in their values and underlying philosophy to develop a new profession in its own right, the one we all hold dear to our hearts, the profession of occupational therapy. Our message is clear today. If Octavia Hill and Dr. Elizabeth Casson had the strength of character and the determination to view occupational therapy and public health as two separate academic disciplines, then we must continue to recognise and honour the aspects of shared values and beliefs within the context of two discrete underlying professional philosophies. Public health, like many other academic disciplines, has similarities and commonalities with occupational therapy, but the comparison is not sufficiently robust to position occupational therapy as a profession predominantly within public health. Current day leadership in occupational therapy also requires occupational therapists to be bold, strategic, tenacious and dynamic. And so for my final argument, preventative approaches and secondary care are not mutually exclusive. 
there is an underlying assumption that secondary care is reliant on the medical model and therefore is not conducive to preventative and person-centred models of care. Traditional models of service delivery within secondary and tertiary care are perceived to have focused on rehabilitation or restoration of function, as opposed to health promotion. Yet the World Health Organization's 2012 definition of rehabilitation cites prevention of loss of function as one of the key rehabilitation measures. We have witnessed the shift in the scarce occupational therapy resource away from secondary and tertiary care to primary care and integrated health and social care partnerships. However, the fundamental needs of our clients has not necessarily shifted among, along with this. In the recent stroke audit, the evidence confirms that the average stroke patient receives 16 minutes of occupational therapy a day while in an acute stroke unit. We spend more time talking about and writing about our patients than we do in delivering direct clinical care. Increasingly, occupational therapists are, however, leading services within secondary care and delivering within models of care that are not medically driven. Instead, we are facilitating collaborative approaches, supporting engagement in meaningful and person-centered programs to help individuals achieve their personal goals. Positioning occupational therapy within public health instead of secondary and tertiary care will not strengthen the position of occupational therapy as a profession, nor will it improve the wider understanding of what we do. It will only contribute to increased vulnerability, uncertainty and potential loss of status as an independent academic discipline. That concludes my rebuttal of the motion that this House believes that occupational therapy should be placed predominantly within public care and not secondary or tertiary care. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jenny. Almost a perfect, uh, perfect 10 minutes there. Um, the gloves are off. Uh, it's a fad. It's a flirtation. Uh, there were, it's a long flirtation, it's been going on since 1779. Um, but uh, citing some big beasts, Elizabeth Casson, uh, Robert Owen, Octavia Hill, uh, arguing that uh, actually the affinity uh, should be that with primary care, and that needs to be a closer um, fit than we have at present. And it's certainly no magic transformation. Let's hear now for the second speaker for the proposition, and this is uh, Anne Johnson. Anne. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jenny. Um, that was very interesting. <laughs> yeah, but um, history, well, we move on, don't we? Uh, history is history. Uh, prevention can't happen if you actually intervene by the time that a person is in crisis. And uh, historically, the definition of public health has certainly moved on from the days when my mum used to take my brother to the children's health clinic in the pram, leave him outside while she went in to get rose hip syrup and orange juice. Um, it's moved on uh, a lot. So just to relocate ourselves in, in uh, more modern definitions of public health, um, in the guidance for public health uh, content within pre-registration curricula, which was uh, put together by the Council of Deans for Health, so they're the ones that look at uh, pre-reg courses for AHPs, that was September 2017, uh, a very full definition um, was included. Um, and it talked about, yeah, it talks about prevention, Again, I say you can't really get involved in prevention if you're actually intervening at the point when somebody's in crisis. It's a nonsense to think that you can. Uh, protection, protecting people, vulnerable people. I think we all do that uh, as humanistic practitioners. Uh, wider determinants of health. We're talking about socioeconomic uh, determinants there. And health improvement. And, you know, I read this week uh, in, in OT News about a team who are helping people with dementia to actually improve their health and well-being by 
uh, facilitating a regaining of uh, skills lost, uh, who could have been actually written off um, in a more traditional sort of uh, healthcare model. Um, so, but what is health? Well, it's not just what the, the World Health Organization talked about, the absence of, of sickness, illness. Um, from a philosophical perspective, health can be seen as a, a state of harmonious being. Uh, and certainly the German philosopher Gadamer talks of, of harmonious being and about ill health being chaotic being. Um, the four areas then, uh, domains if you like, in, in a more modern take on public health are as follows. The first one is health protection. Uh, and I want to illustrate these four to tell you where we think, Dora and I think, that the biggest gains can be made by occupational therapists and, and our profession moving forwards. Um, the first one is health protection. This is the screening program, infection control, uh, appropriate use of antibiotics, uh, radiation protection. Now, arguably, as Jenny said, uh, that's not really a domain, perhaps, that we would be so involved with, although, you know, with, with the uh, moving on of non-medical prescribing, etc., it may be, and we all get involved in, in, in trying to advise people around infection control. But the other three domains of public health in, in this new and wider definition are wider determinants of health. These include access to education and employment, and I think this is one of the areas where one of our biggest gains can be had. Um, and the work agenda, bridging the gap between the people who work, who are without a disability, uh, and the lack of work employment opportunities for people with a disability is scandalous. And as occupational therapists, you cannot call yourself an occupational therapist if you don't ask that work question. Um, also, education, education for vulnerable children and uh, young people. Dora mentioned about us being more present in nurseries and schools, etc. It is too late by the time a young person gets into secondary or tertiary care. We need to be there earlier. Uh, in the wider determinants of health also is about supporting vulnerable communities. Uh, people with disabilities are, you know, could be in there. But we have changing demographics. We have uh, people coming into the country who are not able to do all they want to do, become who they want to become, and belong to our society as, as, as we think we, you know, we are able to. So that's domain two. The third domain is health improvement. And this is a huge area where occupational therapists could be situated in public health settings for our service user benefit. Uh, and when we talk of public health, yes, that might be a clinic situated perhaps in a GP cluster. It could be uh, a, a single GP primary care uh, practice, although it's going to be less and less. Um, so the health improvement agenda is about Falls prevention. Now, we know that if you can get in early, uh, we can uh, prevent those uh, people having to go to A&E, having to be admitted to hospital, having maybe not very tailored care in lots of people's experiences. So we take umbrage with the fact that uh, Jenny suggests that uh, being situated in primary care or public health settings is less tailored than actually being in a secondary or tertiary setting. It's a load of codswallop. Um, public health is much more person-centered in its wider form, remember, not outside with the pram with the rose hip syrup, in its wider form. Um, we can be there and help our patient service users uh, to stay out of hospital. No one wants to be in hospital. No one wants to die in hospital. And if you had the choice, you know, most of your occupations and your occupational identity happens in your own place of work and home. You certainly don't want to be on a ward where you might see a therapist if you're lucky once a day. Um, you want to be in your own home. Along with the health improvement program then, comes the occupational health ergonomics, okay? We know uh, that in work environments, schools, 
all sorts of places um, that occupational therapists are already working um, to improve people's environments, to enable doing. Um, the world would be a poorer place if we weren't there and we weren't there early on. We know that we can help to prevent musculoskeletal issues from occurring um, and that's where we should be. And other community development programs to bring communities together so that people can give something back to society. The final quadrant then of the uh, public uh, health uh, domains, uh, number four, is the healthcare public health. Bit of a mouthful that, but really, gosh, this is what you know, I certainly do every day. Early interventions and confirmation of diagnosis. In my own practice, GPs now ring me and say, yes, this person's been, I think this person's got chronic fatigue syndrome, but actually it's only me that thinks that. I would like your opinion. Okay, so historically, things have changed. We need cultural change. We cannot do it if we sit in secondary care and do not come out and get out more, if you like, into the communities that we know. Supporting self-management. Uh, okay. We have an ageing population. We have a, a, a working ageing population. Um, if we want to help those people to have uh, lives that matter, to live, not exist, um, to be able to have control over most of the part of their lives where we're not around and we can't be around, um, we can foster supported self-management, uh, like the Healthy Prestatin programme in Wales, um, where supported self-management is being delivered to really good effect, um, along with uh, other things around obesity, uh, diabetes, employment, uh, back skills courses. Occupational therapists are right in there. Um, I noticed also in OT News this week that uh, it, Essex, I think it is, are, um, are going to be advertising for 50 occupational therapists to be involved in new ways of working that are not based in secondary or tertiary care. They're out there supporting people, just like you and me, to actually carry on doing our daily doing. Um, the other thing that comes in, two other things that come into that fourth domain of the healthcare public health are rehabilitation and enablement. I don't really have to say much to you about that. Uh, I think most people in this room would know what that is. And management of chronic conditions. Okay, we can't be with people the whole time. But what is going to be our, our offer? In my own practice, we offer stratified uh, model of intervention. Thank you. Um, which is universal. It's targeted and it's also specialist. So we can be there for basic information right through to complex case management. We need to be. Thank you. So um, not all history is bunk, but we need to come up to date and uh, address the world as it is today, says Anne. We need to look at the wider determinants of health. We need to look uh, at health improvement and uh, community development and to tackle the challenges we face uh, here and now. Let's have our fourth speaker speaking against the proposition. It's Diane Cox. Hello, my name is Diane. Well, they've, uh, our colleagues have posed some interesting points. However, Jenny, our lead opponent today, has raised some very important aspects and arguments that if we were predominantly in public health, this does give rise for concern. And we believe you should vote against the motion. Our current healthcare system dichotomizes between physical and mental health, health and social care, despite the need for integrated health and social care systems, as we are integrated occupational beings. We as occupational therapists work across the lifespan with all people with any possible health and social condition. How can we be predominantly in one field or level of care or service. I put it to you, we cannot. We need to be equally in all. 
I do agree we need to be in preventative health and health promotion, but our skills are needed across the health and social care domains placed upon us by society. People will continue to have, as Anne has already said, long-term conditions and disability, thank you Anne, that require our interventions at home, in clinic, in hospital, and in specialised units. If, what if occupational therapists were not in secondary and tertiary services? What for those of combined comorbidities or the hard to treat conditions or those following trauma or injury? What if they need us? They need us as occupational therapists to enable them to fulfill their potential equally in secondary and tertiary care as well as in primary care and public health. So it is equally and not predominantly and therefore, we strongly recommend you reject the motion. Let us consider for the moment if we were infrequently or rarely in secondary and tertiary services, as we were predominantly in public health. There would be no stroke rehabilitation, no home interventions or adaptations following trauma or injury, no support or interventions for those with acute or longer term mental health conditions. The Royal College's strong campaign, Improving Lives, Saving Money, recommends that occupational therapists need to be equally in primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, and public health. For those who heard the Casson Memorial Lecturer last year, by me, um, we are one of the least likely professions to be taken over by robots. That is because of the complexity of being human. We are all occupational beings, we are complex, and we often need the skills of an occupational therapist across the lifespan for any condition an individual may encounter that may be physical, sensory, cognitive, perceptual, or emotional, or all of those. If we are predominantly in public health, what happens to all of those people in secondary and tertiary care that need our interventions? There is strong evidence of the impact of occupational therapy in secondary and tertiary care. Public health is not primary care. As occupational therapists, our skills and expertise have value across the spectrum of the whole healthcare journey. What of those born with disability or those living with comorbidities across physical and mental ill health? It's often said we're the jack of all trades and the master of none, but we know that is untrue. We are masters of occupation and we're skilled in its use in rehabilitation and habilitation. And we are needed across that life journey of all levels of health and ill health. And for those living with the consequences of occupational disruption and disability. Occupational therapists, you as occupational therapists, some of you will support premature infants and parents in neonatal primary care. We work with parents and preschool children who are learning to cope with the effects of genetic disorders. We are based in specialist schools for children and teenagers with special educational needs. We provide in-reach into mainstream schools, enabling children to have integrated education with their peers and deliver key roles in child and adolescent mental health teams. Do our colleagues feel that these areas of practice are no longer needed? Occupational therapists deliver vocational rehab for people with learning disabilities or those with long-term mental health conditions or life-changing physical injuries. Is vocational rehabilitation no longer of value? Occupational therapists enable people with conditions such as dementia, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, to maintain engagement in needed and desired occupations and to remain socially included. If we move predominantly into public health, what happens to those people who develop these conditions and are referred into secondary and tertiary services? It is true that occupational therapists can deliver extremely useful preventative interventions in the public health arena. But this should not be at the cost of other types of evidence-based interventions. 
This would be like saying, as the, as the saying goes, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Occupational therapies, education interventions in secondary and tertiary services enable people to learn to self-manage their long-term conditions, to provide skills and knowledge to parents to empower their children to learn and develop, to support family carers to care for a person in their own home whilst looking after their own physical health needs with safe moving and handling techniques. We educate staff in nursing and residential homes to engage residents in meaningful activities. Occupational therapists provide compensatory interventions using adaptations and equipment that increase people's independence and quality of life. Whilst restorative interventions in secondary and tertiary services lead to people to return home, to work, and to their roles in the community. Therefore, we should not be predominantly in any one domain or arbitrary level of health and social care system. We are masters of doing, being, becoming, and belonging. Using occupations as a means for remediation, facilitating adaptation, and recreating identity. We are all occupational beings, and we support those we work with to be all they can become. As Jenny has already said, public health, like many other academic disciplines, has similarities and commonalities with occupational therapy, but the comparison is not sufficiently robust to position occupational therapy as a profession predominantly within public health. Current day leadership in occupational therapy requires us to be bold, dynamic, tenacious, we work across the health and social care systems to gain the understanding of a person's life, their experiences, their expectations, and their aspirations. We facilitate recovery where possible, maintenance and creation of new skills through engagement and participation in activity. Jenny and I do not deny that occupational therapists should be looking for opportunities where occupation-focused interventions can add value, such as social enterprises. But public health is defined, modern version, of science of protecting the safety and improving the health of communities through education, policy making, and research for disease and injury prevention. We do not refute the importance of occupational therapists being part of this aspect of health. However, not at the detriment of occupational therapy in secondary and tertiary services. As occupational therapists, we practice occupations to enable targeted changes in a person's life through focused decision-making, consciousness and repetition to enable people's occupational well-being. We need to be equally and not predominantly in all levels of surface and care. So therefore, your only response is to reject the motion. <clears throat> so an, an impassioned final contribution there from, uh, from Diane. Uh, occupational therapy needs to be it represented in all uh, service uh, domains and uh, painting a rather dystopian uh, image of, uh, if I may say so, of a future without any support for stroke rehabilitation or people living with acute, acute mental health needs. Uh, and uh, um, it, uh, it can, of course, have a role in prevention, and it is preventive, but not at the ex expense of um, other services. I think that was your... It was indeed. Right, let's hear some... You've heard from our four protagonists. Let's hear some views from you, for and against. Um, uh, I, I don't think we've got a system of, of being able to take people be able to show which way you're going to speak, so we'll just have to take it as it comes. We have two roving mics, we'll come to you. If you could say who you are uh, and where you are from, that would be most helpful. So who wants to chip in on our theme? I have a hand, I see a hand there, thank you. <coughs> Hello, um, my name is Gary Walls, I'm a, an occupational therapist in a community brain injury service here in Northern Ireland. And while I agree with the aspiration of uh, being based in, in public health, uh, I'm 
I have a, a comment to make from a practical point of view, not a strategic point of view, uh, in that if occupational therapists weren't in secondary and tertiary care, they would uh, not be exposed to the consequences of illness and injury. And I think that's a very important learning experience. It was for me as a young OT. I, I work in a community setting now, but the exposure I had and the learning experiences in the secondary and tertiary environments uh, would give me the confidence to, to work in, in public health now. And if we were predominantly in public health, that would be a very uh, a big loss, I think. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. I, I suppose there is a slight uh, uncertainty of meaning in, in, in the motion. Uh, we say, it says that occupational therapy needs to be predominantly based in public health, comma, not in secondary or tertiary services. I'm, I'm, I'm in personally inferring that it's not predominantly in secondary or tertiary services, uh, and not, not at all, but that may be, you may take a different view. <laughs> um, let's hear, uh, let's, uh, yes, a hand down here. Colin Jones, Occupational Therapist, Birmingham City Council. Um, I think it's, I, I hear both sides of the argument and I really feel there is real benefit from having um, public health engagement. But it's about balance, isn't it? And just like balanced occupation, if we're predominantly in any one area, that's not necessarily healthy. And it's finding the right, um, the right service at the right time to borrow from children's services. That actually, maybe what we need to do, rather than predominantly be anywhere, is be more balanced. Therefore, surely we have to reject the statement. Thank you, Colin. Um, balance is the key. Let's have some more observations or questions. Yes, somebody there. Hello, I'm Suzanne, and I work at Birmingham Children's Hospital in a highly specialist service. Do you think that if we were predominantly in public health, that there is the risk of occupational therapists becoming a little bit watered down um, in their understanding of medical um, problems and consequences of things like rare conditions, where although we don't want to follow a medical model, we have to put the understanding of the problems, the medical problems, into context so that we can work with the person in, and their occupations. Thank you. So that rather echoes Guy's earlier point about it being an important learning experience to be, to be exposed to secondary and tertiary services. Hand down here. Um, hello, I'm Alison McCracken, occupational therapist based in London at the moment. Um, my question is around where occupational therapy is based. We, talk, we heard a little bit about occupational therapy becoming public health, but from what I understand this is more about where the occupational therapy service is based rather than it morphing into a public health. Um, and my question is around where we think occupational therapy could have the most influence. Um, because I'm sure that lots of occupational therapists find that there's always more work that we could do and we don't have enough time to do it. Um, so it's also about where we can have most influence. And I wonder whether in favour of being in public health services, whether being in the room with architects and pub other public health workers, we could make sure that buildings, for example, are accessible in the first place rather than us having to firefight and then make them accessible after. Thank you. That's an interesting point. So where, where can uh, you have most influence? And, I'm, and if I may say so, perhaps also where you want to symbolically place yourself in, in the context. Sir. Okay. Um, I'm Glenn Mason from the Human Support Group. I, I think prevention and early intervention is obviously very, very important, but so is reablement and promoting independence. So I, I really don't think that the right place for OTs, occupational therapy, is in public health. Occupational therapy is too important just to be in public health. Thank you, Glenn. Too important. Uh, we're down. Where are we now? Yes. Hello, I'm Bev Taylor-Wade from the Learning Disability Specialist section. Um, I work in a specialist intensive support team and I see very frequently people in crisis situations where we find it very difficult to be effective in trying to support them, where I think um, our services could be much better placed doing early work to give people the opportunity to enable them to have good lives and good quality um, occupations before they get to a point of crisis situation. 
Thank you, Bev. So a bit of a pushback from the last couple of speakers uh, in, in favour of, broadly, of the proposition, I think. Yes, a hand there. Just. Um, I'm, my name's Louise Patterson. I'm a research occupational therapist at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. Um, I'm just wondering, in the age of um, advancing genomic medicine and personalised medicine, um, in the future, we're going to need to be involved in prevention and planning interventions with patients who may know what their future health and social care needs are going to be. Um, so will our work automatically move towards public health as this um, new advancing in genomic medicine is going to be more prominent in the future. Thank you, Louise. So will you be taken there anyway? Do you actually need to go with the tide? And there are two hands just in that row there. Hello, uh, my name is Tia Moorfield. I'm a student at Blindroy University, second year. Um, I'm just wondering if we transferred OTs into public health, where that would make or where that would leave students if they go on placement and their learning opportunities and the value of the learning experience that they would have from placement. Very practical question about student placement and yeah. next to you. Yeah, my name's Deb. I have written guidance on housing developments, um, plug sockets, door accesses, steps, ramps. I've also written guidance on accessibility to public outdoor spaces, particularly shared spaces, which have real implications for people with visual impairments. But I did that as a town planner. 20 years ago, I qualified as a planner. Next year, I will qualify as an OT. And I'm wondering whether that guidance would have been better prepared in the first place by an OT, or whether I probably did an acceptable job as a planner, and why OTs should have the corner on that. Uh, you said you, so let me just keep the mic for a moment. You said you, 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 you wonder, what's, what is your view at the moment? I think I did, I think I did quite a good job first time round, actually. <laughs> uh, let's, let's have some more observations. Over the side, anybody over the side? Hi there, I'm Louise and I work in community mental health. Um, I guess I'm very aware of the stigma um, that comes along with mental health difficulties um, and um, the discrimination often in terms of work. And I guess my, my point is that I would be in favour of um, having more occupational therapists at earlier stages um, in public health to... Um, to stop some of the sort of structural injustices that prevent people um, from engaging in work and meaningful occupations. So more but predominantly, that's the question. Um, predo um, <laughs> I, I think there needs to be occupational therapists in both, but I think predominantly based in, pu in public health that... <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, my name's Helen Cooper, I also work in mental health. Um, I actually think prevention is cheaper than the, the, than the cure. Um, and although having a balance between public health, secondary and tertiary, I think if we did have a, a clear-cut balance, the side would probably sway towards public health in the end anyway, because the prevention is there and then we don't need to find and work with the cure, if that makes sense. Thank you. Public health starting to get the upper hand here in the discussion, I think. Uh, hand up there. Um, my name's Charlotte Sullivan. I'm from West Cork in um, the Republic of Ireland. I'd just like to make the point that no matter how much public health we have, we will still have chronic illness, chronic disease, um, people are generally not following a trajectory of improving public health despite massive budgets in the public health domain. So I would be in favour of a balance across uh, community, public health, primary care, secondary and tertiary, and I see a very valid role for OT in all those settings. Thank you. And there was a hand at the front, uh, further down. Yes, gentlemen there. 
Uh, my name's Rob Brooks. I'm the course director for occupational therapy at Leeds Beckett University. Um, one of the documents that might help guide us this are our sustainability and transformation partnerships. Um, some colleagues and I looked at all 44 of them and conducted a content analysis looking for occupational therapy. Um, you won't be surprised that there wasn't a huge amount there, but what was there did guide us towards the idea that occupational therapists should be involved in, a public, in the public health agenda. However, it also led us to think that this should not be at the detriment to the specialist services that are in secondary and tertiary services, which are needed um, when um, the public health agenda perhaps has not, um, is, is, is a long road for us to deliver on and actually we need right now to, to be managing the health needs of, of, of our current population. Thank you, Rob, but can you do everything? I mean, is, is, yep. is, is the funding in the system to allow you to have the luxury of being across all, yep. all, the, all the bases? Um, let's hear some, yes, a hand here. Hi, my name's Sarah Mercer. I'm a clinical research student at the University of Southampton. And I've kind of got a foot in both camps at the minute because I am researching a public health intervention that the fire service have put into place. Um, but I work clinically in a secondary community team. Um, I think my view would be that the, the work that the fire service are doing that I'm looking at they didn't use an OT to design it. Um, maybe my personal belief, it would have been better if they had, but they, they did something good. Um, now, say they had got an OT involved, that would have taken one OT to do that, that then could be rolled out to a massive scheme that they're doing, which is great, it sees loads more people. What I'm finding out, though, is that it is a preventative intervention, but it's not stopping people you know, potentially being the people that I then see in my secondary team. Um, in that work, I know just how many occupational therapists we need to deal with those people. It's just so many more. So it's kind of, I see it on that practical level as a numbers game, that yeah, it'd be great to have way more preventative work done, but we still need a lot of boots on the ground in those secondary and tertiary services, and that's not gonna change. Thank you very much. Yes, let's go up there. I've got two, I can see two hands. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Steggles and uh, I'm a retired OT, but I was director of professional practice with the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists. So I did a lot of advocacy work for um, OTs in public health and I think two areas that we haven't mentioned where we can make huge population changes rather than one-on-one -on -one changes is um, with the homeless population and in criminal justice where I think there's a huge role for OTs to work with populations rather than individuals and have a big impact. So Elizabeth, if I may, would you, coming back to the motion, are you arguing in favor of those words, predominantly in, in public health? In favor of OTs, predominantly in thank, public health. Thank you very much. And there was a hand at the back, a little bit further back, yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zara, I'm a final year student at Huddersfield. Um, the point you made that, uh, I think it was Jenny who originally made it, that health promotion, promoting health for people isn't mutually exclusive with the secondary and tertiary uh, work, but it also reminded me of something um, someone I was speaking to who's been qualified for maybe 40 years recently said to me um, that OTs have been pushed into dis discharge planning as he saw in secondary services and actually while within our professional identity we would be thinking that we can have those more educational interventions and things, are they prioritised under getting people out of hospital? So in the reality of practice is that really as big a part of our role as perhaps it should be? Thank you very much. We've got about five more minutes available for, for your contributions. There's a hand here in the, right in the middle. And if, if you want to come in, can you indicate and we can try and come to you more quickly. Um, 
Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a student at Leeds Beckett University. Um, I, I was just thinking as well, um, it maybe isn't necessarily about separating occupational therapists that have to work in one area or the other, but maybe like those concepts around public health promotion are really important, and maybe it's about in encouraging OTs in kind of all services to, to continue to promote those principles around health promotion, self-management, because there are always going to be especially difficult to reach individuals in those other services that still need those, those principles to be promoted for them and, and their occupational justice needs to be met as well. So. Thank you, Katie. And did I see a hand over here? Hello, my name is Julia Scott and I'm an occupational therapist. I'm wondering if, uh, the, this is fascinating, I wish I came to this conference more often as a dentist, it's absolutely <laughs> great. Um, but I'm wondering if there's something here about, not the words we're discussing, but the difference between a population-based approach and an individual approach to people in need. Um, and I think we are very, very good at helping individuals in need, and we love to help individuals in need. But I think there's also an argument that there's too many individuals in need, and we do need to get upstream, as you said, David. So, so um, I, guess, I guess I am hearing what people are saying, more about the population we serve and how we serve them, rather than in relation to where we happen to be based. Wise words from the leader. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Shona Strachan. I am an occupational therapist, which is lovely. Um, I normally have to say I'm an EHP, so it's quite nice to say I'm an occupational therapist. I feel quite passionate about our role in public health. I think we need to very much work around that agenda and own it and get that upstream work. Having done some work with the public health colleagues in NHS Grampian, when you look at their agenda and their self-management strategy and all the work that they're doing just now, it is actually the curriculum that Jenny and I did in the early 80s. So we really need to engage and own it. Overall, I'm not sure that I can agree with the motion because I think we need a balance. I think it's everywhere. But we really do need to own that public health agenda because it is occupational therapy. Thank you. Are there any more hands? Gentlemen, do, no, no. Do I see one over there? No. Last, oh, one in, the, one in the middle down here. Got two or three more minutes for this. Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm a student at Leeds Beckett as well. Um, I just, I think that we do need a role in public health. I do agree with you. But I think, as you said, that um, it's going to be a cultural change and it takes a long time to bring in that change. And at the moment, we've got like more and more factors causing ill health, like we've got a rising obesity level, we've got so many more. And I just don't think at the moment we're in any position to be like majority, in a majority predominantly, placed in public health rather than secondary and tertiary services. I think there's such a huge need still in those services, even if ideally we would be in public health. And just a bit further forward, if anyone's got a real humdinger of an argument, this is the time to deliver it. <laughs> um, I work in emergency medicine. And your um, name is? Georgia. Thank you. Um, in London, and I see on a daily basis the pressures that our current healthcare system is facing, the volume of patients that are attending secondary and tertiary services. Um, and I can very much appreciate the value that occupational therapists bring to front end services and secondary services in intermediate care, and the, the thought of channeling uh, the, the role of occupational therapy away from that into public health, it actually scares me. <laughs> um, I, I certainly understand the value of, of OT in public health, but certainly the, the value that therapists can bring in secondary and tertiary services in our current climate is um, immense. Thank you. I think we're on last call now. Any, any last, last clinching arguments that you've been saving up? I'm a, 
There we are. That's it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a second year student at Canterbury Christchurch University. Uh, my concern is that if occupational therapy continues to be in, uh, an increase in public health, that we will become uh, a, a, a blurred profession. We will lose our identity. I think, following on from my, uh, one of my fellow students over there, um, the concern is that we are become a, we're going to become a generic role. We're going to lose that zing that we bring to the services. And I think that if we continue to go further into public health, our identity will, as a, as a profession, will uh, decline and we will become a jack of all trades. Okay, you risk losing the zing you bring. I like it very much. Um, right, that's been a really well balanced uh, and really interesting discussion from the floor. Thank you very much for that. Now we're turning to the two lead protagonists to re respond to some of those points, obviously not all of them, but because they only have five minutes, but to respond to those and to sum up on uh, their case. And we're going to start with Dora. Okay, thank you everybody uh, for the comments. I suppose maybe we just need to look at exactly what this, this statement says. And it says the House believes that occupational therapy needs to be predominantly based on public health. It doesn't say only. If you look at health as a population, we're very wide. And then we go narrow into waiting lists. And then the top individual of greatest need get occupational therapy. The amount of waiting lists that we have are phenomenal. How many of you would think if somebody had been able to be seen in their GP surgery earlier by an occupational therapist, they wouldn't be in such need now. I thank my colleagues um, for the sort of talk around, you know, occupational therapy on the wards and the very fact it's sort of 16 minutes per day. That works out, average admission into hospital is approximately seven days. If you're talking about 16 minutes per day, that's an hour and 10 minutes per week. Mm -hmm. What is the intervention you can achieve within that time without having follow-up in public health within your GP surgery that you're going to refer out to. I appreciate reablement, et cetera, sit, sitting in secondary services. However, should it be? Should it be sitting in your GP surgery? Should it be that the person has to get onto a bus and travel an hour to get to a hospital just to see you? Or are we actually looking at demand and capacity? Occupational therapists, we are a small number. However, does that need to be? Is it not a case that we need more people trained, we need more people engaged, and we actually need to get a mobilisation to make sure that there are more individuals that are able to work within public health? That means that you can still get to the specialist whenever you need it, but actually the majority of the work is actually completed within public health arena. So I suppose what I would ask you to do is to actually sort of consider, I mean, I thank my colleagues who actually argued on my point quite a few times, saying about being in GP surgeries, et cetera, whenever actually that isn't in secondary or tertiary care. Um, you know, so thank you very much for that. We do need to be mindful of some of the things that were sort of being said um, around, you know, being able to enable people to self-manage and support families and carers, which exactly we can do if we're sitting in public health. There's a lot of the argument that was actually said, if we were available and we had the numbers, we would be able to react. And therefore, would that individual need to get through all those waiting lists, all those barriers, all those other individuals that say, actually, an occupational therapist might be needed? If we were so good at what we do, and I'm going to be very challenging at the highest level, everybody would know what an occupational therapist does. What we're suggesting is in public health, everybody gets to know what an occupational therapist does and also gets to know the speciality that occupational, ha occupational therapists have in their specialist areas as well. Thank you very much. And to close for the argument against the proposition, Jenny. Okay, so positioning occupational therapy predominantly with public health is tempting. Tempting within the context of a child standing within a sweet shop, excitedly trying to decide whether to choose between love hearts or Maltesers. 
besieged by the variety and choice and unable to make logical and rational decisions because of the overwhelming temptation. In the absence of empirical evidence, I'm guessing that at this exact point in time, this child is not thinking, if I eat sweets, I might become that one in three children who become obese, increasing my risk of staying obese for longer, making me seven times more likely in adulthood to develop type 2 diabetes, potentially causing blindness or limb amputation. Nor is that child likely to be thinking about the risks of developing heart disease or stroke and that they are more likely to be living with depression. And I'm absolutely certain that child is not thinking about when an occupational therapist will enter their life and where that occupational therapist will be based. Let us not be tempted like that child. As a strong and mature profession, we can logically and rationally consider the arguments for and against the positioning of occupational therapy, predominantly within public health. We have both the knowledge and the force to resist the temptation of being seduced by the dark side. <laughs> Leadership in occupational therapy is key as we position the profession for the 21st century. And leadership is everyone's business. We all have a responsibility to educate, inform, influence, and contribute to the development of robust knowledge of the value of occupational therapy. But for those of you who do require evidence, then we need look no further than the national statistics. The reality is, as you have all indicated, that we're experiencing unprecedented levels of hospital admissions, which continue to rise exponentially year on year, despite public health promotion. Our hospitals are in crisis due to the complex needs of those requiring admission as they live and age with multimorbidities. Hospitals continue to be the default position, whether we like it or not. Although the development of preventative and primary care models have been a policy ambition for some time, non-elective admissions continue to rise over the past two decades with worrying signs that primary care is buckling under the current pressure of demand. Many of the approaches are experimental, with primary care often operating in too small a scale with inadequate access to specialist support and diagnostics and has workflows and processes that are inappropriate for the types of patients it deals with. And we must be clear that public health is not primary care. And so the challenges for occupational therapists to be predominantly based within public health are arguably even greater. Of course, disease prevention and health promotion are important, but so are the broader aspects of occupational therapy. The Royal College of Occupational Therapists cl are clearly articulates within their Living Not Existing campaign. I remember my first professional trip to London as a very new occupational therapist to attend a meeting at which Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, and Jackie Stewart, the former Formula One racing driver, were advocating and campaigning for the introduction of airbags and use of seatbelts in cars to become the law in an attempt to reduce the number of injuries caused within road traffic collisions. This was passed as law, and yes, we did see a reduction in brain and spinal cord injuries, but when these injuries do occur, they continue to have devastating consequences, even 30 years on. At a recent event, an emergency department consultant colleague of mine talked of the preventative aspects of emergency medicine, stating that the time for prevention was before the accident or injury. The strapline of the Scottish Trauma Network is saving lives, giving life back, developed within the acknowledgement that the heroic life-saving approaches are only worthwhile if people are supported to re-establish their former identities and life roles. Something magical needs to happen within our healthcare system to improve the current situation, and that magic is occupational therapy. Occupational therapists must acknowledge the value they bring and the burden they lift from the healthcare system. Now, more than ever before, occupational therapy requires to be positioned within secondary and tertiary care, providing balance across the spectrum. Thank you, Jenny. Could you wind up? Occupational therapists are a scarce and precious resource. We have a responsibility to use it wisely. Thank you.
So, you have heard the arguments for and against. You've heard the debate from the floor. Now is the time uh, to vote again uh, on the proposition. And we're going to count it this time. So, uh, we're going to take a, a, a proper um, vote for the historic record. Um, so, use your vote wisely. Um, so, to remind you, the motion is, this House believes that occupational therapy needs to be predominantly based in public health, comma, not in secondary or tertiary services, full stop. As I said, you may wish to uh, imagine that the word predominantly features again um, between uh, in and uh, between uh, not and in secondary, <laughs> but you may not. I leave it to you. Those now in favor of the motion, please show. And keep your hands up, please. And can we have some lights? Are you all done? Are people adding votes? Yes. No. no, I think I think we'll have to take it, take it as it was. And those now, uh, those now against the motion. And are there any abstentions? Just one. <laughs> I, the, 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 um, the, the numbers are now being tallied and they'll be with me very shortly. It looked to me as if the motion was lost. I think we all agree that, but we're going to get the exact vote any minute now from Connor. Here it comes. How exciting. <laughs> Drum roll. Thank you. <coughs> <laughs> Those for the motion, 73. Those against, 109. Uh, it's been an excellent discussion, uh, an awful lot of fun. I think, as Julia, as Julia observed, this may be, uh, there may be something shared on both, in both camps about uh, a, a more population-based approach. It's just a question of getting from here to there. Um, thank you very much to our speakers for, for keeping it civil. Some harsh words were exchanged. I did, I did hear Cod's wallop. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure they're going to kiss and make up uh, <laughs> outside. So thank you very much. Please join me in th thanking the speakers very warmly. <laughs>